Uh, will you please welcome to the stage the man behind that film, Richard Lowenstein. Um, how do you f you've been travelling all around the world watching this film in front of audiences? Your relationship with Michael goes back decades. How do you feel watching a film like that again in front of an audience? I saw you were sitting down there earlier. I was. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, <coughs> there we go. Yeah. We're working. Ooh. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's hard when it's three times a day, but um, today is okay. It's Today's sort of, okay. yeah, and I ran out in the middle, but it's it is a bit emotional to watch it. It's less emotional editing it actually, because you're just focusing on a little little section of it. But um, seeing it, you know, seeing your friend sort of live and pass away three times a day can get a bit stressful. Yeah. Mm. So where does your relationship with Michael and NXS begin? Because your company produced most of their music videos, is that correct? Yeah, ba back starting in 1984 with Burn For You, we, um, we just got a call out of the blue. We'd done Hunters and Collectors, talking to a stranger, and I'd made a feature film, um, Strikebound, and then we got a call out of the blue from a kind of crazy manager saying, come up to Mackay in North Queensland and, and start filming, and so we did and um, that we ended up in London on that same video and then through that process I got quite friendly with all the band members and uh, specifically Michael who was, you know, really made an effort to connect to the whole Melbourne zeitgeist that I came from and hunters and collectors and all that sort of street cred that that <laughs> brought about. He was desperate for that Melbourne street cred <laughs> which he got. Yeah. You know. Was it apparent to you very early on that he had as a very special star quality. Did you realise that early on or did it gradually dawn? Well, it, it was apparent uh, as soon as he stood up from the banana lounge out uh, with there was, you know, six of them when we first met around a pool in Mackay in Queensland. And as soon as he stood up from a banana lounge and walked towards me, I thought, Jesus, that's this guy's got charisma. I didn't necessarily connect that with, oh, he's going to be great on film. But... Um, yeah, uh, as we filmed and as we did some of the music videos, it became very obvious that there was something special that would jump out of the screen. And then, and then he's, um, and that's not always that doesn't always mean acting, you know. It just means screen presence. So then, literally, just hanging out with him and seeing his abilities of mimicry and sort of telling a story, and that that's what's struck me as like this guy's got something on screen you know like as an actor too you've directed drama films he died with the falafel in his hand you've made documentaries you've worked in tv there's been a lot of coverage of michael hutchins over the years lots of you know tell-all interviews yeah. and documentaries yeah. why did you decide this was the time to do it um I basically didn't see anything in any of those things, the dramas, the documentaries, the, all the variety of things um, that reminded me or even had any, even a semblance of the person I knew. Mm. And so there was a personal reason, like I thought, you know, if when I go or when all the people that knew him go, that this, there won't be anything, there won't be any accurate history of this uh, musical figure, this part of Australian history. But there's also, on top of that, there was just the uniqueness of his story. It wasn't just a, a normal story growing up and five guys, six guys in a garage. It was, it was quite a unique and psychologically unique story, like a Greek tragedy, you know, mm. complete with, um, you know, Oedipus sort of complex and, um, and Narcissus and all, you know, it's like and Zeus throwing sort of bolts of lightning down and knocking mm. him off his perch, and it was it was crazy when you when you when you put the story together. Whenever you see a film like this, particularly a music documentary, maybe because I'm a Craven TV producer, my first brain goes to what was the hardest bit of footage or the hardest <laughs> talent to get involved. So everyone's just watched it. What's the shot in there that took the most effort to get? Well, it's, it's, it's a two-pronged question. The hardest person to get involved was Helena Christensen. And, um, and she... Really, I had my money on Kylie. Uh, Kylie was quite easy because um, we, we had been friends back with, when she was with Michael and she's just such a trusting, lo a loving, lovely person. And she absolutely loved Michael and wanted his legacy put down accurately. And so she just opened her archive 
um, Helena was very protective because of what she'd experienced with, with the uh, assault stroke accident and she, she'd literally personally pro promised Michael never to speak about it. And, uh, but she did also realise that without her saying her part of the story that no one would ever um, remember him in a fair and equitable, equitable way. So she did decide for the first time ever to get that um, you know, do that interview and, and also offer us some photographs and stuff like that. The, mo the most um, remarkable footage we, d we turned up is the Kylie and Michael on, a, on the boat in Hong Kong Harbour because um, Kylie would tell me this great story about their first date and, and then she sort of sa said, and Michael was filming on a camera and we're going, oh, where's that film? And that she was going, oh, probably that crooked lawyer that stole everything, took it. And, uh, and then uh, in the process of making the film, I had a lot of stuff in my attic and we, um, I get a phone call from the laboratory and saying there's all this footage of Michael and Kylie on a boat in Hong Kong Harbour in your own footage. <laughs> and I'm going, how the hell did that get there? And uh, apparently what had happened, and I still don't recollect this, but he'd come back from that holiday and given me, you know, the little Kodak boxes and handed them to me and said, you know, get this process because I have no idea. And I did that. It was in the rushes of some of our music videos in amongst all the sync takes and that just turned up and it was... It was unbelievable. I was sort of preparing for the big archive search around the world. Where is this footage that Michael... And then it was in my own attic. <laughs> Which is why you should never clean up your house. Hoard everything all the time. That, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point because majority of music video clip directors of the 80s would throw out all their outtakes, you know. And I'm a bit obsessive. My mother was a librarian. I just kept the rusty tins in my attic. Whereas if you say, you know, you go to the director of all the early Nick Cave videos, it's all gone. They just throw it out because the final master was all you wanted. But now with HD, the final master's no good. Yeah. It's, it's, so they just threw it all out. And for some reason, I kept it. Mm. The first person you thank, and I'll be careful with this, because the first person you thank even before you put your credit is Tiger, uh, Michael's, Michael's daughter. Why, yes. the first, why the first credit to her? Um, well, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to say too much because Tiger's a very uh, private person and, uh, you know, absolutely didn't want any publicity from this film and everything. But she, she was very instrumental in enabling us to get the In Excess music. I, I got to say, In Excess management were not approving of the film at the beginning. They couldn't control it. They wanted right of final cut and they wanted to, you know control their own image and how many songs of In Excess I would use and all that, you know, they would also more than likely would have stopped any solo works coming in. So I couldn't actually give them right of final cut for a variety of reasons. And it was only Tiger's intervention at the end of the film, once it had all been made without the music, that enabled um, the band and the management to finally, you know, say, here's the music. So she gets a, a very... Special thank you. So was there a moment in time where this film might have had to have been released without any of In Excess's music? Absolutely. It was, there was a year and a half of editing without In Excess music and no one believed we could make it an engrossing film and I was sure that I could and, uh, and we did. And, but it was obviously a better film with In Excess music and that's, that's literally the point where everyone was saying, yes, well, this, this will work and it tells a great story, but there's a, a part of it really missing, you know. And we had the In Excess cover versions, like it wasn't so much the master recordings, it was the publishing that we had issues with. So we could use um, think cover versions that did like The Loved One, which is a cover version. So, but yeah, all the, all the great songs we know and love were unavailable to us. And, but we did, there is a version and it, it works quite well, except, you know. Missing. Do you guys have questions? Are there things you'd like to know about the making of the, of the film? 
There's always this blank moment when you ask that question on a stage where everyone's, oh, shit, I didn't realise it was a part of it. But yeah, here we our go. Fr- our friend. Was there a, a question <laughs> down there? What we're going to do is we're going to get the, um, the lovely, the cuddly, ba- cu- cuddly, bouncy mic. Yes. It's no, on its way to no you. No one's got it. I think you I think shout, ran try off for shouting it. and we'll repeat the question. There we go, There's the cuddly the mic. Cube. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, um, I'm a massive fan of Richard. Uh, oh. Just as a, uh, you're, you're a photographer, live music photographer. And that filmmaker thing. Film, yeah. Filmmaker. And what what got you inspired? And, what, and how did the the kind of uh, the paths align? For you to be like meet Michael and um, meet Inexcess. You mean back at the origins? The yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it was it was basically um, as I said, a phone call out of the blue where uh, Michael had seen the talking to a stranger video and decided he wanted one of them, and because uh, that sort of did. I mean, t- Hunters and Collectors were a very cool Melbourne band. They weren't they weren't nearly as commercially successful as Inexcess, but it's sort of like hunters wanted the success of NXS and NXS wanted the coolness of hunters. And so I, I do think it was his first um, idea was to get uh, a video, because as videos were just, you know, becoming very powerful at that stage, getting a video that looked like the Hunters and Collectors video. And there's also another connecting thread. There was a, it was a, one of his best friends was a guy called Greg Pirano who was the percussionist in Hunters and Collectors. So he rings up Greg and says, who's the guy that did your video? And Greg says, oh, it's that Richard guy. And then the rest is history, yeah. Uh, who else has questions? Uh, there's a person at the back. Unless you are stretching. Were you stretching? You Wait, wait for the cube. Wait for the cube. There Ew. it is. Strong catch. Could I ask Richard uh, what his favourite video The mystify one at the end of the... I always wanted to do the mystify. I thought they... Actually, when they did the Kick album, they um, sent me a cassette and basically said, which one, which song can you do the best video to? And the first of all, I said, Need You Tonight. And then I said, the ne- and the next one would be mystify. But they didn't release it until, like, the fifth single. Mm. I'm sure it would have been another number one. So... I've spent sort of 30 years waiting to finally do it, which is why it, it ends the film. <laughs> but Need You Tonight, I think, is probably my most enjoyable. A- and the follow-up, the one that comes after um, Mediate, yeah. It's, uh, I, I, we were talking in the car on the way over to both you and the wonderful editor of the, uh, the film as well. Taylor, Taylor. Where are you? Over there, yes. <laughs> yeah, there she is. The red dress. Yeah, actually, yes, get, yes. Like the song. Uh, and what I was fascinated to hear from both of you is that uh, you did a bunch of test screenings with people and, and friends and family. Yes, yes. And that, Mystify was not always going to be the ending of the film, was it? No, we, we kept swapping songs. At one stage we had um, By My Side as the last song and it was, it was so um, unbearably sad that everyone sort of felt they'd been hit by a truck. <laughs> And it was, and you, we probably wouldn't be having this Q and A because you're just like, oh dear, and and also ultimately, by my side, wasn't written by Michael, so we we did swap it and test screened it again, and it did leave everyone with a, a much more, um, you know, alive feeling, like because it, you had to, once you have your hero, you know. Um, pass away, you have to sort of remember the spirit of the person and bring, in, bring mm. the spirit up. And, and this version of Mystify with all that footage, and especially on Wembley, it was really beautifully filmed and he really was at his peak. So um, we ended up swapping it to Mystify and the whole dynamic kind of changed at the end. Yep. Mm. Who else has a question? There's one right down the front here. We'll wait for Cube. Here comes the Cube. Here we go. Just talking to. Um, you've done this so well, and um, Thank I, th- you. I think it's you've just showcased him so well, and he, he was a lovely and a most beautiful person. Um, you mentioned you did like a year and a half of editing, mm. and you also mentioned you were playing a little bit with the end and how it also then changed the mystify. Mm. But knowing him and putting so much of your you know your love and all of your memories into it, is there anything in this that you wish you could have put in that you haven't? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I wished it could be a four-hour film, you know, it's like... Can or you do another one? Yeah, well, there's, <laughs> there's going to be heaps of DVD extras because we had lots of sequence. In the process of getting to this, it's deceptively simple what you see, but, you know, it, there's, there's sort of perhaps another hour of cut sequences that we then have to cut out because, you know, it's for a variety of reasons. Even there's a ten-minute section about him acting that we, we spent, you know, months over and, and I, refu you know, adamant it, ha it was an important part of the story, refused to cut it out and finally, you know, everyone, including the collaborators in our company and uh, making the film, the editors, they all, we all decided it was probably better out than in because it became, you know, when, when something, when you're sitting in a cinema, different television, it's, you're, you're very aware of when people start sort of moving in their seats and going, this is going on too long and, you know, like, we know the ending, when are we going to get there? And so even though it's all this lovely um, sequence about his acting career and we had amazing footage from behind the scenes of Dogs in Space and other films, uh, the, um, the Roger Corman film, The Frankenstein Unbound, he, he actually filmed his own footage, behind the scenes footage. We had all this amazing stuff, but it sort of was slowing the storytelling down. And, I, and one of my in most important things was keeping the story moving and, and also speaking to people who weren't NXS fans or weren't even Michael fans. You had to sort of, you know, you had, you had to um, make the film as if the person sitting in there had never heard of anything that you're gonna, about to, tell. So, um, yeah, the storytelling, the pacing of the story won out. But there's, as I said, heaps of DVDs, DVD extras coming, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank <laughs> you for your comments. This might seem like a, an obvious question, but typically speaking, when one makes a documentary, it is filled with famous talking heads that talking you can put heads. into a promo. Yes. You <laughs> opted not to do that. You get this stream yes. of consciousness, like people talking in directly into your mind as you're, as you're yes, seeing yes. Michael. Why not the talking heads? Um, there's a couple of reasons. There's, there's some very prosaic, which is, you know, the pros I'll start with the prosaic ones. I just didn't want people looking at the talking heads and say, oh, they, they haven't aged well or they have aged well or there's a little bit of work going on there. And, <laughs> and um, so, I, but I also, the, the most important one is I didn't really want to throw you back and forth in time all the time. I didn't want to bring you forward to 2018 or whenever I filmed those talking heads and then take you back again into the past. I wanted to actually start off with a, a journey in time, even though it's out of order sometimes, non-linear. It's um, take you back into the era and keep you there. And then, so when you hear, it's like people's voices don't really age or they age a little bit, but faces and images do. So I just, I, I really, um, on certain documentaries, unless the talking heads are telling you something about your story, um, I didn't, I didn't want to see the person crying or the person, you know, it's like, but I, but I loved hearing them. And also, Another really prosaic reason is that I had so much great footage of Michael and we've only got a hundred minutes and they wouldn't, you know, my producers wouldn't allow me more than a hundred and five minutes and why waste it on 20 minutes of talking heads, you know, just, just go back and tell the Michael story and not the talking heads people's story. Great answer. Who else has a question? We've got time for one or two more. quite well and you obviously had a, an incredible amount of footage but you obviously also maybe got some insights that you didn't know or from a different perspective yes. did your perspective then of him as the person that he was did it change through making the film or did it stay with pretty much who he was and you just had extra layers no I, I think um, <clears throat> I think my um, knowledge of him grew as uh, and, you know, that's one of the reasons I wanted to make the film, but basically I realised in the process of the film making that we were dealing with a much more complex character than I ever knew myself. I mean, there was, there was a danger as, a, as an Australian male bonding with another Australian male. Um, there's a, a danger of just sort of going into the parties and having the fun and not really thinking about the person that you're actually you know, you're connecting with because you're just 
there, you know, you don't know they're going to pass away soon, and and you're just experiencing the good times. And Michael was in love with giving his friends the good times. Like, this is what it's like to be a pop star, but it's no fun doing it by myself, so come along and join in on the ride. And, um, and that's one of the reasons I focused on the girlfriends, because they were experiencing the Michael. They would wake up with him, go to bed with him, see him crying, see him curled up in the bathtub in the fetal position. They, You know, stuff that the Aussie male doesn't hear about from their best friend. So um, I, I was discovering in the process someone much more complicated than even I thought. But that was the agenda of the film. I didn't think Australia or the world actually knew how, who he was. They just knew this sort of stereotype, the long-haired, loose, <coughs> womanising rock star, you know, who dated supermodels. And especially in Britain, I think they were brutal and still are about um, the cliches and the stereotypes they put him into because they're far more interested in Sir Bob and Paula and all that stuff and then suddenly there's this dirty dingo or whatever they called him coming and violating their, you know, like, like Paula was Princess Di or something. And um, so it was, uh, I did learn, uh, yeah, just how prismatic and how he would show different parts of himself to different people and that part of my job then became putting all those different um, aspects of who he was into one portrait so that, you know, yeah, so I, I really appreciated his complex, you know, I actually didn't realise the secrets that he, he was holding within him um, to the very end. I, I literally thought I was going in to make a film about someone whose loss of smell and taste had sort of caused his demise and I didn't, I didn't realise the full extent of what Helena was going to tell me or the coroner's report or all these things. So, yeah, it was... I, d I just didn't expect the secrets, you know. Yeah. Uh, do we have time for one more? Who else has got a question? Oh, yep. Without the NXS guys or team members and uh, Michael's family and friends seen the documentary yet and have they voiced their opinions on it? Um, they've all they've all seen all well the three NXS members who um, are still in Australia have seen it. The um, I don't think Andrew Farris has, but um, he trusts his other band members. But the the three Kirk, John and Tim saw it in a screening in Sydney and were very emotionally um, overcome and, and kind of loved it but but basically said I don't want to do that in public I don't want to actually watch the film in public because every time they watch you know it, it represents something very big to them not just the loss of a friend the loss of a lifestyle the loss of a career <coughs> and so it's a very private grieving that they have and I think that goes for a lot of the um, the people in the film. A lot of them didn't want to come, you know, Michelle, Kylie, um, Helena didn't want to come to any screening at all with, in public because, you know, it, it, it means a hell of a lot. As far as family and friends, they all, you know, Tina, Rhett are the only two surviving family and, and Tiger, of course, they all saw it and approved and loved and, you know, I think there's some few niggly little things Rhett and Tina might have that um, but but they they got emotionally overcome and in, in it when it screened at the Sydney Film Festival there was you know at least twenty to fifty percent of the audience were friends of Michael and so it was kind of universally um, welcomed and yeah I, I think it, people just uh, liked the fact that it's the first time that it was uh, you saw the story that with a sense of authenticity on who he was. And without all the salacious gossip and and you know the the stuff that that um, was all over the headlines at the end, which was um, which about the autoerotic stuff. So I think it was um, a relief for most people that that had kind of been put into context and put to bed. Hopefully, so you know. All right, uh, this movie is going to be showing. It, it is showing at big screens yeah, it's at the moment. At the so moment. if uh, now you guys have seen it, make sure you tell your friends to go see it. Uh, it will also be on TV screens later in the year, I believe. And it's, yeah, it's really good in stereo, uh, Dolby Stereo Sound 5.1 and everything. So it's really worth seeing in a in a proper cinema. All right, give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Enjoy your last Thanks day, Splinter in the Grass. Thanks so much, guys.